Uh, all great enthusiasts, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, apologies for starting a little late today. <coughs> Those who are having a problem with his uh, device. But such things do happen with the very newfangled devices. Anyway, welcome and uh, uh, good morning. To, uh, good morning. I, I happen to be in the USA, so actually it's good good night for me. But all the same, good morning to all of you. You are in the US? <laughs> yeah, I am in US right now. Anyway, I would like to start by, by being quite honest that uh, Jamalpur has a very special uh, meaning for me. Apart from uh, being uh, staying in Jamalpur for four years as a special class railway apprentice, 20 years later, I was posted in Jamalpur uh, as a working railwayman, so that I've spent 10 years of my working life at Jamalpur. So I know Jamalpur reasonably well, and it is, it is very close to my heart. In the last year of my stay in Jamalpur, a new batch of special class railway apprentices joined, and among them, we had today's speaker, Mr. Deepak Sapra. Deepak Sapra also spent four years in Jamalpur as a special class railway apprentice, and later was posted on Eastern Railway. So that since Jamalpur is on Eastern Railway zone, uh, his connection with Jamalpur continued. Deepak is a very good writer, a very good traveler. He speaks well, writes well. Uh, most of you would have read his book, The Boy Who Loved Trains. Anyway, I will not take more time because we are already running a little late. And uh, Deepak, hand over to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, am I audible and visible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you are audible. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, wonderful. So, uh, thank you everyone for joining in. I uh, have to admit that it's very daunting to be uh, talking about a subject uh, which a lot of people are, especially on this call, are very, very familiar with. And a lot of people on this call have very direct personal experience, just like Mr. JL Singh mentioned. So uh, what I've tried to do in preparation for today's uh, uh, talk is to talk less about, uh, about the big things, the, uh, you know, the buildings, the locomotives, the coaches, the infrastructure, but to talk more about the human angle behind all of that. And uh, uh, what I will do today is to uh, narrate the story through pictures, the story of the life and times of people in and around Jamalpur, and also how certain decisions got taken as a process of which uh, the town established itself as India's first, uh, India's first railway town. Uh, what we will also try to understand is uh, as the town developed around the railways, how different aspects of life began to revolve around the railways, a template which was to later play out in many other places in India. At its peak of uh, uh, activity <coughs> in Jamalpur, there were where the population is about a lakh people, there were about 15,000 railway employees. So if you count the family members, almost 60,000 people in the city were directly linked to the railways. 60% of the population was the railways. The rest of the people were essentially those whose life, occupation, and economy revolved around railway families. And therefore, there was a very, very strong interlock between the way their lives traversed and the lives of the others. So uh, since uh, many of you have... Uh, a lot of experience of Jamalpur. Uh, I will also try to leave some time towards the end so that uh, we can listen into your perspectives and reflections as well. So uh, with that, I would like to start. Uh, I'll, I'll share my screen. Uh, Apurva, if you could just let me know when uh, the screen is visible. Yes, then, sir. Uh, Bulldog. Sure. Huh? Eight minute. I'll just... Uh, Uh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So if you could minute, give minute. me the rights to share the screen. Make co host. Up career, try this. Okay. Fabulous. Yeah. Is it visible? Uh, yes. Visible. visible. Yeah, yeah. visible. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Fabulous. Fabulous. So uh, this is the uh, story that I want to talk about. 
uh, the story of Jamalpur, India's first railway town. Now, uh, before I start, I just want to make a comment on this. This is a picture of Jamalpur station, which I had taken in 2017. Uh, now, here you can see the board. Uh, the board is uh, uh, having Jamalpur written in four languages, English, uh, Bangla, Hindi, and uh, Urdu. Uh, it's not very common. Uh, we do have some stations on the Indian Railways where you see the name written in uh, four languages, but most of them have three, English, Hindi, and the local language. Uh, there are some, however, such as uh, Hazrat Nizamuddin, Durgapur, Palakkar, Anand Vihar, uh, where, uh, where you have names written in four languages. But Jamalpur has names written in four languages for a reason. And we'll talk about it as we see, as we go along on this, uh, on this discussion. So I'll move on uh, before I uh, just quickly give a framework of what I want to share today. We will, uh, I want to start uh, with a few acknowledgements and thanking a few people, and then we'll move on to the geography, history, and the railways and life in Jamalpur. Thank you. So uh, if I look at uh, some of the people who have uh, greatly influenced uh, what I'm, uh, what I've written here and what I've put in here, I think uh, it is uh, from the people who, whose names you see on the screen. A lot of the material and photos in this talk has been uh, a consequence of either their uh, insights or the work that they have done or the things, uh, articles and photos that they have written and published. I want to start by thanking and expressing my gratitude to Mr. J.L. Singh for his unwavering commitment to Jamalpur. His books and uh, numerous articles that enhanced my understanding, including the uh, very, very uh, nicely compiled book uh, around the 75 years of IRSME. I also want to express my deep gratitude to Mr. G.S.P. Rao. Uh, he stays here in Hyderabad. He was born in Jamalpur, so he was a railway child uh, from day one. He wrote a book on Jamalpur, which he calls A Labor of Love, which is, with a huge amount of information and beautiful pictures. Uh, uh, for those of you who have not read the book or seen the book, it's available on Amazon. And uh, I, uh, you can take a look at that. I also want to thank uh, uh, three people who have lived in Jamalpur and also studied there. Uh, Mr. P.C. Sain, Mr. Nagarajan, and Mr. Anand. Uh, Mr. P.C. Sain is an SCRA of the 1949 batch. He studied and worked in Jamalpur, extremely passionate about uh, Jamalpur and his continued relevance in the railways, even today at the young age of 91. In fact, when he heard that I was going to give this talk, he, uh, he gave me a few anecdotes. He told me a few things which I should cover. Uh, so I really salute the spirit and the deep attachment and commitment that he I also want to express my gratitude to uh, Mr. Nagarajan and Mr. Anand. Again, both of them have uh, lived and studied in Jamalpur. Uh, and both of them have been outstanding proponents of uh, explaining the evolution, history, uh, and geography of Jamalpur. And they have a host of anecdotes related to railways and Jamalpur. So those of you who have not been fortunate enough to interact with them, I do request uh, you to do so. And I also want to uh, thank the compilers of two beautifully done websites, uh, the links of which are here. And I think uh, they have done an extremely good job of putting a lot of stuff together on Jamalpur and around uh, Munger. So with that, I move on. I want to start with geography because geography will give us an understanding of history and history will tell us what the present is. So uh, if you look at geography, uh, this is actually a Google map uh, screenshot of uh, and uh, this is also a screenshot of uh, uh, of the uh, of the uh, way the map is depicting uh, the ganges as well as uh, how it's looping around. Uh, if you can see the orientation, it flows around Munger. It flows in three directions: uh, eastward, westward, and northwards and it loops around the city. So the Ganges is very much an integral part of, uh, of Munger and life in Munger. And uh, if I 
go next this is uh, these are pictures from present times uh, one of them is taken by me one of them i have borrowed uh, from the internet uh, this is a, uh, a picture on the river ganges uh, this is the shri krishna setu uh, what we call the munger ganga rail kam road bridge and uh, this connects jamalpur junction and ratanpur railway station on the saheb ganj uh, loop through munger railway station with a station called sabdalpur junction which has recently been established on the north end of the bridge and onwards to saheppur uh, and onwards to saheppur and other stations on east central railway so this is uh, something which has recently come in this becomes the third bridge on uh, the ganga in bihar there is one uh, uh, there is one at uh, upstream at mokama and then there is one downstream near bhagalpur and this is uh, really the third ganga crossing in bihar if you move further on uh, zooming into the map which we just saw on the previous slide then this map is a visual uh, uh, representation of uh, of jamalpur as you zoom in you can see shaded areas you can see jamalpur junction on the left hand side you can see the eastern railway workshop at the uh, at the 7 o'clock uh, point you can see the golf course you can see the east colony and you can see the new addition the diesel locomotive shed all of this points to a very high degree of concentration of railway establishments in and around jamalpur and that is really what uh, jamalpur is all about even today more than 150 years after it was established i'll move further uh, this is uh, uh, these are two pictures uh, taken by me uh, in 2018 uh, one is the raj mahal hill range and the view of jamalpur from uh, top of the hills so uh, what happened was that uh, there is this paleolithic site uh, of kali pahar uh, on top of the hills which was the location uh, for early and middle stone age uh, quartzite implements the raj mahal hills uh, of course the way you see it in season quarrying has altered the landscape quite a bit but uh, one can still see uh, from the picture on the right hand side the workshop the railway colony the army area and uh, you know we didn't have drones earlier and in the absence of a drone when i used to live there and uh, many others we used to climb up the hill to get the top view of the surroundings so uh, so that's uh, uh, you know that's the uh, that's a picture of the landscape of jamalpur now uh, we've understood the history of uh, the geography of uh, munger how jamalpur fits in uh, in that geography and uh, i'll now move on to uh, to how the history of the place really impacted the way things uh, shaped out in the course of uh, the evolution of jamalpur so these are three pictures uh, the first uh, the two on the left hand side are uh, from munger uh, so munger does found a find a mention in mythology in the ramayana as well as the mahabharata uh, in the ramayana uh, the sita charan where sita uh, sita uh, apparently walked and that's a famous site in munger and uh, in the mahabharat munger finds a reference uh, as part of the kingdom of anga which was ruled by the tragic hero karna and uh, from there on uh, there are also uh, references to munger in as madhya desh of the early aryan settlers so uh, then uh, while these are mythology and this is legend on the right hand side uh, you actually see an image of uh, it a painting of yun sang uh, the great chinese traveler he visited this area towards the close of the first half of the 7th century ad he observed a large number of buddhist monasteries he saw about 4000 priests there and i think that is something which uh, gave a very good idea about the way the uh, town was the way life was and uh, he also mentioned about certain hot springs uh, which existed in this area which by the way today uh, relates very closely to to the sita kund that you see uh, in the top left picture which is one of the uh, most important places for people to visit in munger uh, history evolved history evolved uh, munger passed through several hands from the karnataka dynasty to the slave dynasty of the moguls uh, however the most significant impact 
in the present day life at Jamalpur was due to this man in the picture. Uh, this guy is uh, Mir Qasim, uh, the then Nawab of Bengal. Uh, he, uh, he, he was the Nawab of Bengal from 1760 to 1763. Uh, he got installed as the Nawab uh, with the support of the British East India Company. And uh, he did so by replacing his father-in-law, a person by the name Mir Jafar, who was himself earlier supported by the East India Company uh, after his role in winning the Battle of Plassey for the British. So, uh, however, uh, Mir Qasim, uh, once he uh, ascended the throne as the Nawab of Bengal, he shifted his capital from Murshidabad to uh, Munger and uh, uh, this shift happened in the year 1763. What you can see in the uh, painting on the right hand side is, uh, is, a, uh, is the Munger Fort. And in the Munger Fort, a factory for the manufacturing of firearms was established. And uh, this is something which, uh, uh, which had a very, very important place uh, in the way Jamalpur panned out as a railway town. Uh, he also uh, raised an army, he appointed an Armenian general, and he started financing his uh, troops by streamlining tax collections, and uh, was considered to be a fairly just ruler, uh, well liked by his subjects, and an equally ruthless one for his enemies. Uh, eventually, he lost uh, to the British in the Battle of Buxar, uh, when they could not agree on certain terms of settlement with regards to taxes and with regards to the trade passage to the East India Company. And that really led to a host of changes uh, in Munger. So the next uh, picture, uh, if you can see on the slide, uh, as uh, Mir Qasim lost out, the British gained control after the Battle of Buxar and uh, reinforcements were set up in Munger. Uh, it was around the middle of the 19th century that uh, trains started running in the UK and it was natural that they would come to India for the British to streamline communication and strengthen control. And uh, that is when uh, Calcutta, which was the capital of India at that point of time, and Delhi, which was a very, very important center, uh, the British wanted to link these two cities. And as you, uh, as they started linking the two cities, broadly what they had in mind was that uh, the a large portion of the uh, railway connection would kind of flow along the Ganges. And uh, that is where uh, they started creating the railway infrastructure and uh, creating, uh, uh, creating all that was required to make trains run from Calcutta to Delhi. So what you see here in the picture is the picture of uh, the Jamalpur tunnel in some places, it's also referred to as the Munger Tunnel. The picture on the left-hand side is from is when you enter from the Jamalpur end, and on the right-hand side is the when you exit. And uh, this was constructed uh, in the year 1860-61. Uh, it was a part of the expansion of the EIR from Howrah towards Delhi, and thus this became the first line connecting uh, Calcutta and uh, Delhi. The route which was there, uh, it required the construction of a tunnel through the Rajmahal Hills, which we saw in the geography part of it, uh, to cross uh, the Jamalpur Hills between Jamalpur and a station called Ratanpur. Uh, this tunnel is about uh, 875, uh, uh, 800 and, uh, sorry, 275 meters long. And uh, uh, you know, this was the original. Uh, uh, this was the original uh, route. After that, uh, uh, the EIR met with phenomenal success as uh, more and more people started using the trains, started patronizing the trains. It uh, seems that 40 million people used the, uh, per year began to use the EIR services. And as a result of that, uh, a huge amount of interest was established. So a dual track with a shorter route from Calcutta to Delhi and this one connected Rani Ganj to a place called Lucky Sarai, uh, not far from Jamalpur, close to Kewl, was constructed. And it became what is now called uh, the main line on the Howrah Delhi route. Uh, what this did was it reduced the distance by about uh, 160 kilometers. And the route which is going through Jamalpur, uh, the Sahib Ganj loop, uh, also continued to be in existence. Trains continued to move. But then we had a shorter 
uh, route, uh, which is the uh, which is the one through uh, what is called the main line today. Subsequently, however, we also had the cord line which went through Gaya and which further cut down the distance between uh, Howrah and Delhi and uh, brought the distance down by another 140 kilometers to about 1,441 kilometers from Howrah to New Delhi today. So, uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, this is the tunnel, which was of course a very very important part of the railway connection flowing through Jamalpur. And then, as we move forward, I want to talk about uh, this. I want to talk about uh, uh, what happened as a consequence of that. What happened as a consequence of that was that uh, the Jamalpur locomotive workshop, uh, which was the really the first full fledged railway workshop facility in India was founded on the 8th of February, 1862 by the East India Railway Company. Uh, why was this chosen? This was chosen because of proximity to the Sahib Ganj loop, the history of which we just uh, uh, heard a little bit about on the previous slide, and, uh, and also to the communities of the gunsmiths and the mechanical craftsmen in Bihar. Uh, when we uh, read about uh, Mir Qasim and his establishing uh, gun manufacturing in Munger, uh, that skill, that skill in engineering, that skill in metallurgy really came to the fore and a lot of mechanical craftsmen were enrolled and the British thought that it was a good place to have the right supply of talent uh, to establish an important railway workshop on the most important trunk route in the country at that point in time. Uh, when the workshop was established, it was initially for uh, repairing uh, locomotives and assembling uh, new ones uh, from salvaged parts. Uh, this is really what uh, the workshop was doing in the 1860s when it was established. Uh, however, the workshop made great strides because of the huge amount of focus that was provided by the uh, British and also uh, the availability of talent uh, that you had around that area. Uh, they purchased about 202 locomotives to refurbish in 1865. Uh, in the year 1872, about 452 locomotives were assembled. Uh, in uh, 1872, I think a uh, rolling mill uh, was added. In 1879, the ice factory was established. Also in 1879, the first tender for steam engines uh, was manufactured at the workshops. And uh, in 1892, uh, actually, loco locomotive manufacturing started, uh, except for wheels. Uh, in 1889, uh, the crossings and signals manufacturing started, and uh, all of this, uh, all of this really uh, continued, uh, uh, continued, and Jamalpur became the hub of activity, the hub of industrial activity. What you can see here is uh, an image uh, from the workshop just when it is, uh, uh, you know, there is. Uh, uh, the shift is getting over and uh, the, uh, the energy is palpable, the number of people, the various kinds of things that are ongoing, the activity that is palpable. And it really was, it really was something which was very, very significant at that point in time. All of this changed uh, in the year 1897. And uh, what happened in, the 1897, uh, in 1897 was that on the 12th of June, there was an earthquake. And uh, in this picture uh, from the workshops, you can see that the upper story of the building has collapsed. And uh, this really led to a lot of damage, uh, uh, a lot of damage uh, that occurred and uh, a lot of things changed. This earthquake was uh, also incidentally uh, one of the most devastating earthquakes that India has ever experienced. It had its epicenter in uh, Meghalaya, but uh, was about 8.7 on the Richter scale. And, uh, and as a result of that, uh, you know, there was a huge, uh, uh, there was a huge damage which was caused even to a place like Jamalpur, which is far away from Meghalaya. Uh, unfortunately, as we'll see later, uh, this was not uh, the only earthquake uh, which uh, Jamalpur experienced. There was a much more devastating one in the 1930s, which led to a lot of changes and a lot more damage uh, because the epicenter of that earthquake in uh, the 1930s was uh, actually close to Munger and uh, while it was 8.6 on the Richter scale, a little lower than, uh, a little lower than uh, the one in Meghalaya. But, uh, you know, because the epicenter was close, there was much more impact uh, to, the, uh, uh, to Jamalpur, the workshop and uh, everyone in and around. 
uh, post earthquake however it was very very important that there be a rebuilding effort and uh, efforts were undertaken on a war footing and uh, which is what i want to show on the next slide that uh, the rebuilding effort started in the right earnest uh, it was so important that the then viceroy uh, visited the workshops on the 30th of november 1897 uh, there's a little bit of confusion on that date. Uh, some uh, archives uh, mention the date as 30th November. Some places mention at 3rd of December, 1897, but doesn't matter. I think what is important is that uh, there was a huge amount of uh, emphasis and importance given to the workshop and about getting it back on track, especially after the devastation of the earthquake. So, uh, so as that happened, I think uh, towards the later part of the 19th century, towards the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the workshop really progressed to uh, making its own locomotives. Uh, while it had established its own iron and steel foundry, the rolling mill, as I mentioned, it produced cast iron brake blocks. But what was really the most significant thing was that it started producing its own locomotives. It produced the first one in the year 1899. Uh, it was called Lady Curzon, uh, CA seven six four, and while the uh, while the image here is not of Lady Curzon, there are no images apparently available, and nobody really knows where that locomotive uh, went after it was taken out of service in the nineteen thirties. But uh, it was a very important and significant event in the history and evolution of Jamalpur. The CA seven six four rolling out of the workshops. At that point in time, it cost about 33,000 rupees to make. And just to put it in context, when you uh, normalize it for exchange rates and when you normalize it for, uh, for the cost at which locomotives were getting manufactured in the local manufacturing uh, factories in the UK, uh, this was about 30% of the cost at which uh, the locomotives in the UK were manufactured. So this was a very, very significant achievement. And I wanted to uh, share that as an important milestone in the history and evolution of Jamalpur. So that's a little bit about the history, a lot of it getting driven around uh, the workshop, uh, getting driven around uh, how the uh, railway lines evolved and how really the whole railway setup got to be established after uh, you know, uh, after the Havra-Delhi uh, railway connection was thought to be a very, very important part of uh, the British control. So uh, from there, I will now move to the present. Uh, from the history to the present, I uh, will talk about some of the major uh, railway establishments uh, and, uh, uh, you know, what uh, they look like today. What is the story behind them? So... Uh, uh, we spoke about this. This is the entrance uh, to the uh, Jamalpur workshop. Uh, we uh, spoke about it in great detail. Uh, while we know that it had a lot of firsts uh, to its credit, uh, I think the workshop really uh, became very versatile over a period of time and uh, developed several capabilities and uh, started uh, started working on cranes, started working on jacks, started working on the overhauling of uh, uh, diesel locomotives and various other railways equipment. I would say one of the uh, most versatile uh, setups, uh, industrial setups as far as the railways are concerned, not just in India, but also anywhere in the world. The next picture I want to show is uh, one of my favorite pictures, uh, which uh, uh, it's a picture taken by me in uh, the year 2017. Um, this is a, a metallic sculpture of uh, Lord Vishwakarma uh, at the entrance of the Jamalpur uh, workshops, the divine architect of the gods in Hindu mythology. Uh, why is this important? Uh, it's important because uh, Vishwakarma is all over the place in the workshop. You go to every shop, you go to every little room, uh, you would see an image of Vishwakarma and Vishwakarma being worshipped uh, in the month of September, on the 16th of September, when you have Vishwakarma Puja. Uh, the whole workshop represents a very, very festive look and everybody is extremely excited about uh, uh, about uh, uh, about Vishwakarma Puja. So I wanted to share that. And all of this uh, is uh, metallic. Uh, all of it is made uh, locally at the workshop. And uh, to me, it's really one of the most beautiful things uh, that I see in this workshop. 
the next uh, image that i want to show is again from the present uh, uh, this one has uh, while it is from the present uh, it is an image of the present it was made long ago it was made 150 years ago uh, this is an insignia uh, this insignia uh, decorated the train of lord mayo uh, who was the fourth viceroy of india and uh, this was cast uh, in uh, jamalpur shops The uh, next image that I want to show is uh, this one. Now, when you have a workshop and you have a lot of activity, a lot of uh, technical stuff going on, you need engineers, you need technically trained people, and you need them locally because just the way things are expanding, you cannot manage with talent from outside. So uh, to take care of this, in the year 1888, uh, the technical school uh, was established. Uh, today it's called IRINEE, -E, Indian Railways Institute of Mechanical and Electrical Engineering. And it started in 1888 as a, a small school attached to the railway workshop, which is just a few hundred meters away. And uh, in 1905, uh, this school started a, a very important scheme. It was called the Apprentice Mechanic Scheme. Initially, uh, people of uh, Anglo-Indian origin were allowed and subsequently it was opened up for the others as well. Uh, it was a five-year apprenticeship program. And at the end of that five-year apprenticeship, uh, the apprentice mechanics were appointed as assistant foremen or assistant superintendents on the East India Railway. Uh, this was one of the most important interventions in cadre building and in creating the network of talent and uh, people who really knew how to run the railways bottoms up new things uh, very closely because of having spent five years as part of this experience and uh, it was not long uh, in just six years in 1911 uh, this scheme uh, uh, was expanded uh, to include other indians as well uh, while this continued, I think there uh, was uh, people experienced a continued shortage of engineers and uh, therefore in uh, 1927, uh, this uh, technical school by that time it had come the IRIMI uh, started uh, training uh, what were called the special class uh, railway apprentice mechanical and electrical engineers. Uh, later, uh, uh, this school made the transition and was made one of the uh, centralized training institutes of uh, of the railways. So there is a lot more than uh, just these facts, uh, and we'll come to it when we talk of some of the people. But uh, this uh, this uh, building that you see, this organization that you see on this picture, uh, created one of the building blocks for uh, the for the huge amount of talent uh, on engineering and on the technical side that the railway started to have. So I'll move on. Uh, uh, these are uh, images from two of the people, the early stalwarts of this technical school, uh, Mr. Grundy, uh, who actually uh, was in charge of the school for 17 years from 1924 to 1941, and uh, Mr. Bailey for about seven years thereafter. And uh, this is, uh, again, uh, the kind of work they did to uh, make the curriculum uh, more relevant to the needs of the railways and create more well-rounded engineers as a consequence of uh, uh, sandwiching both uh, practical learning and uh, theoretical learning. Uh, the contribution that they have made uh, to the whole endeavor was enormous. Uh, what I want to share is uh, just one, uh, uh, this is a board which uh, is there at the technical school. It has a quote from Herbert Hoover, the president of the United States, uh, and he pays uh, glowing tributes to engineers. Um, uh, he talks about the fascination of watching a figment of imagination emerge through the aid of science to a plan on paper. And uh, so he talks about it in great and glowing terms, and it is something which uh, uh, he talks about as uh, the epitome of professional achievement to be an engineer who is creating something. So I wanted to share this because it's uh, not about the quote, it's not so much about Herbert Hoover, but it's about uh, the fact that this activity, the engineering on the railways, uh, creation of uh, 
things where uh, nothing existed was such an important thing in the progress and evolution of Jamalpur as a railway establishment and the whole uh, uh, setup around it. Uh, again, this is another image from the technical school. This is the honors board at Irimi. Uh, what I wanted to mention is that uh, there have been a huge number of people who have contributed greatly to the evolution and progress of the railways and also in other areas uh, thereafter uh, and contributed through their engineering skills, through their management skills, and who have distinguished themselves uh, in the railways across the uh, for more than 100 years now and uh, this is really a uh, it's really a role of honor in the true sense and i wanted to share this uh, uh, share this with this group now when you have people when you have students you need a place to stay so uh, a place to stay uh, was set up. Uh, the first one is actually called Queen's Road. Uh, this is the Queen's Road Hostel in uh, Jamalpur. Uh, it is uh, it's a hundred year old hostel. Uh, it used currently it provides accommodation for junior engineers, section engineers, and workshop trainees. And uh, this was built. Uh, uh, this was built in uh, more than hundred years ago, and uh, it uh, it nurtured a lot of people who were pioneers in Indianizing uh, the apprenticeship scheme, apprenticeship scheme such as uh, the late uh, N.K. Bose um, and uh, C.W. Clark, who went on to become the uh, chief mechanical engineer of then East India Railways. So a uh, very, very important landmark. Uh, and uh, this is uh, really the place where uh, post training, the apprentice mechanics used to spend a lot of time and uh, created that esprit the corps, that feeling of uh, being together, that feeling of being a part of the railway establishment, wherein uh, the railways is not just a job, it's a way of life. And uh, all of that, that journey really started here for uh, thousands of people who stayed here and went through uh, the training program uh, on the apprentice mechanic, mechanic scheme at Jamalpur. The next image uh, that I want to show is of uh, Jamalpur Jimkhana. This is the place uh, I lived for uh, four years, my home for uh, from 1993 to 1997, a uh, place where uh, I can say I spent uh, my wonder years, four of the best years of my life, and uh, the place where the uh, special class railway apprentices used to stay. Uh, a lot of the things which used to happen in the workshop and in the technical school uh, were complemented by the experience of life here, wherein uh, everybody was uh, uh, playing a role in not just uh, learning and uh, uh, getting trained in the workshop or in the technical school, but in managing their whole life uh, in a fairly evolved setup. Uh, here in Jamalpur, Jimkhana. Uh, so this has been the home to special class railway apprentices, the first one of whom uh, joined Jamalpur in uh, 1927, uh, a person by the name uh, H.V.M. Stewart, who uh, later migrated to Australia and lived in Perth uh, till the time he passed away a few years ago. And subsequently, there have been about 1,500 people, uh, special class railway apprentices who have uh, who have lived here and who have experienced Jamalpur through the portals of uh, Jamalpur Jimkhana. The next image that I want to show is a little uh, away uh, from, uh, uh, I mean, it's on the parallel road to Jamalpur Jimkhana. Uh, this is the Territorial Army Unit, the TA-967, uh, which was established at Jamalpur. Uh, now, why is this uh, significant? Uh, this is significant because out of the six territorial army units uh, on the Indian railways, uh, this is one of them, the TA-967. It covers uh, Eastern Railway, uh, East Coast Railway, uh, uh, NF Railway, Metro and CLW. It's a kind of a part-time uh, citizen's army. It consists of uh, civilians who are railway employees. Uh, so they're not professional soldiers. They are trained for a certain period of time. Every year they have to go for the camps on a regular basis, but they're civilians. Uh, what it does is it provides an opportunity to receive uh, military training, uh, to meet uh, the country's defense needs, to meet uh, any internal security needs in the case of uh, national emergencies. 
Uh, this was raised in the year uh, 1950 and uh, it moved to the present location uh, where it is today in uh, 1960 uh, when the headquarters were shifted from Lilua near Calcutta to uh, to here and uh, and uh, you know this is uh, this is the place where uh, you see a lot of people who had contributed immensely uh, during the railway strike in the 70s uh, who contributed immensely during the time of any natural disasters and the entire training which went in as part of and the training which went in as part of uh, uh, doing the job on the railways was uh, uh, was really ingrained and established so uh, the next image uh, the, the next theme that i want to talk about is uh, life at jamalpur we've looked at uh, the geography the history the major establishments uh, this is uh, how life is now depending on who you are what you are doing what your role is in the whole setup uh, life can be different but some things are very common one of the most common things is locomotives and uh, this one that you see is the cs773 the shantipur little locomotive it's uh, uh, placed uh, at the entrance of the Jamalpur Jamkhana and it's a beautiful piece of uh, engineering as well as art and uh, you can see it lighted up on festive occasions uh, such as the annual day and on several other occasions so uh, this is an EIR CS 773 uh, and just uh, one representation of uh, locomotives being very much a part of day-to-day -day life uh, in Jamalpur. Uh, this is uh, uh, an image from the station. Uh, what you have on the right hand side is uh, uh, probably the most patronized train uh, from Jamalpur, uh, the uh, 13071 up, 13072 down, uh, Havra Jamalpur Express, which uh, connects Havra to Jamalpur. And uh, what you see on the left hand side is actually the training coach of uh, the uh, Irimi, uh, where uh, you know, the trainees uh, move around when they have to travel on technical tours. And so life really revolves around trains and around railways. Uh, the next one I want to show is uh, an image of uh, this one. Uh, this is the workman train, uh, also called the Shramik Gadi. Uh, this uh, gets people who are working in the workshop uh, to Jamalpur. You can see WMT written there on the board. It's workman train. And uh, it gets in people from Munger, from Sultan Ganj and Kajra uh, to the Jamalpur workshop. Uh, and the timings of the train coincide with the shift timings at, uh, at Jamalpur. Uh, the next one that you see is uh, an image of uh, St. Mary's Church. Uh, again, familiar colors because it's a part of the railway colony. And these familiar colors uh, are all over. And while uh, uh, while life uh, in the workshop uh, in the technical school is of one kind, I think uh, the fact that railway colonies have everything to offer for everyone is really what sets uh, Jamalpur apart. And then this created a template for a host of other railway setups and railway towns in India as well. Where not only do you have work, not only do you have the railways, you have where, the place where you stay, you have the place where you worship, uh, worship, you have the place where you travel. All of this is nicely integrated and uh, an essential element of life that you have uh, in a railway setup. Uh, again, this is, a, this is one of uh, the pictures I really like. Uh, I've taken this picture a few years ago. Uh, you can see colors in the workshop everywhere. And uh, this, is, uh, this is just uh, before, uh, I think, Chhat Puja. Uh, where uh, the workshop was uh, very, very nicely decorated. Again, this is an image uh, from what happens inside uh, railway clubs. Uh, a lot of indoor activity, uh, billiards, snookers, uh, uh, other indoor games such as bridge. A uh, lot of that uh, happens uh, in these railway establishments. A lot of socialization happens as well, not just uh, uh, not just amongst the railway employees, but also their families. And uh, the railway clubs are one of the most important areas for creating that sense of uh, uh, that bonding, that spirit of spirit and uh, that spirit the corps, and that feeling of belonging to one place, which uh, really represents everything around your life. 
Uh, this is uh, an image uh, actually outside of the railway setup, but it's uh, from a small eatery uh, uh, in Jamalpur. Again, what is uh, the uh, the menu is nothing to write home about. Uh, but what is important is that the addresses are still from another era. So you can see this one, Albert Road. And it's uh, absolutely, uh, if you go to Jamalpur, you will see a lot of places which are still carrying the British name, still carrying some of those uh, old uh, signages, those landmarks. And so cooking house on Albert Road, uh, serving uh, Mughlai Paranta and Chow Min, uh, is absolutely harmonious in the way life exists in a place like Jamalpur. Uh, this is the golf course, another aspect of life, uh, especially for those in the railways. Uh, this is a very, very good, it's an 18 course, a uh, whole golf course. Currently, the ITC golf tournament is also uh, held here. But what is important is that uh, sports was an integral part of life in the railway setup. And uh, this is actually a beautiful golf course in, created in the railway uh, in the railway settings and uh, very, very well patronized by a lot of people who uh, worked at the workshop and uh, at Irimi. So uh, this is uh, the golf course. Uh, finally, I think uh, this is an image some of you might be familiar with. Uh, it is, uh, it's a tombstone in the memory of uh, a person by the name Thomas Roberts, uh, who used to work in the workshops. He was in the uh, uh, in the erecting shop at Jamalpur. He was the awards foreman. And, uh, you know, close to the golf course where we saw the previous picture, he had an encounter with the tiger and uh, died in the year 1864. Uh, so uh, at the age of 27, and this monument was uh, erected by his fellow workmen. And uh, it's not common to have uh, fellow workmen uh, erect monuments, but just is a testimony to the fact that life uh, both in and out of the railway setup is so integrated that uh, uh, even the epitaphs have the railways all over them. So, uh, so that's what I wanted to share a uh, glimpse of uh, what life is in what was India's first railway town and really then uh, uh, went on to become one of the most important places in the history and evolution of the railways in India and also created a model for a lot of other places in India to follow in terms of how a railway establishment gets set up and becomes an integral part of life for everyone in, uh, everyone in that place. Thank you. And uh, I would love to hear any questions uh, or any comments or uh, anything, uh, uh, anything that people might want to share. Deepak, Apoorva, the first uh, question that I'd like to ask you is mm -hmm. aap, you said that you lived in the Gymkhana for four years. So why didn't why were you not uh, why why was it not in a hostel? And uh, was it with the family says with the in the this thing? Is it how it works? Uh, it's called uh, Gymkhana. Uh, yeah. In day to day life, we might call it a hostel, but for people who have lived there, it's much more. Sorry, this is back to the Yeah, I know, I know, I know. It's, it's, uh, the it's minute. It's called the special grade hostel. Okay. So yeah, it's, it was a hostel. Mute themselves. Those not speaking, please mute yourself. Deepak, please carry on. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, so, Deepak. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Hemant here. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, sir. Uh, there's a uh, there's another aspect to Jamalpur. Some of the notoriety. Uh, have you heard of Anand Mark? Yes. Uh, thank you for. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, of course. So, uh, so Anand Mark, uh, the uh, the spiritual organization was established by a person by the name P.R. Sarkar, Prabhat Ranjan Sarkar. He was born in Jamalpur. His father was, uh, his father was uh, an employee in the railways. Uh, while they hailed from Bardwan district in West Bengal, they moved to Jamalpur and uh, uh, P.R. Sarkar used to work uh, as a railway accountant in Jamalpur. While he was there, he got uh, 
influenced by yoga and uh, uh, went into a journey, journey of self discovery and uh, as a result of that he started preaching to a, a group of people in and around the railway setup in jamalpur and from there on he really built his uh, uh, built his narrative around uh, the anand marg and established the anand marg and of course subsequently he went to calcutta and anand marg today is in more than 100 countries so uh, so pr sarkar of uh, uh, born in jamalpur worked in jamalpur studied in jamalpur uh, is a very very important element of life in uh, life in jamalpur thank you for pointing it out and then the uh, the uh, mogli boy the uh, i think the, the the seed was sown in jamalpur only that is correct that is correct so rudyard kipling uh, uh, was there and uh, uh, in jamalpur rudyard kipling also wrote about uh, the uh, life at jamalpur uh, both in terms of uh, how the workshops were how big they were uh, he famously mentioned that you can see here in one day what you cannot expect to see in other places in one year uh, in terms of the diversity of uh, in terms of the diversity of various uh, uh, uh various things that he saw in the workshop he also commented uh, a fair bit on life in the railway colony especially the life of people uh, the life of people of british origin life of the anglo indians around that time and the life of uh, the indians so uh, thank you for pointing that out thank you hello hello yes uh can i speak yes yes of course of course uh, thank you mr sapra for giving us a beautiful presentation uh, regarding jamalpur i am uh, dr sudhakar rao i am currently residing in kolkata i was born and brought up in jamalpur studied over there in railway school then in central school and till 81 i was there so i was born in 63 and till 81 so it was a beautiful remembrance which you brought up where i spent my childhood and till the teenage and you have brought everything wonderfully i would just like to add one more thing one more information uh, that is related with film shole uh, dr rao you have gone on mute if you could unmute yeah. dr rao you are on mute if you can unmute and talk about the shole thing that you were uh. oh yeah so uh, in shole sanjeev kumar as an inspector when he was young he catches amita ben dharman jain viru and he says ki jamalpur mein jaate hue and that bit of care, this thing also was shown the tunnel although it was not shot out there but jamalpur is mentioned in shole also and you have beautifully brought up my remembrances of jamalpur and it's a wonderful place and i'm proud that i was born and brought up in jamalpur thank you for sharing uh, dr rao really that uh, that dialogue jab main jamalpur mein inspector tha what yeah. sanjeev kumar says in shole uh, is one of the first things you hear when you stay there and i heard it uh, i think in uh, in my first week of stay there in 1993 and it kind of uh, stayed on it was one a uh, dialogue that you would commonly share with your juniors whenever they would join in uh, so yeah thank you for sharing that but that uh, that scene in which the it represents the tunnel is not shot there i tried yeah. to research on that it was actually shot somewhere on central railway uh, but uh, the dialogue is about uh, jamal yeah uh, jamal mr sir also mentioned in by you have one any association in... regarding jamalpur anything where we can join and we can interact so uh, or any facebook site or anything or any email id can you just share so that we can communicate with you so what i'll do uh, dr ravis i will just uh, send my email uh, id on this group and i will coordinate with the, the others and send you the details uh, yeah, because of places yeah. where you can get more information yeah, because so i, I stay my... in real we are out here here okay. many people who are from jamalpur they are staying although many of them are retired i was given this by one uh, mr devashish ray who is very much senior to you he passed out from special class rail you become mute again 
please unmute yourself. Mr. Rao, we Deepak, can't hear you. Uh, Deepak, are you aware that even uh, Sharat Chan Chattopadhyay, who is a famous uh, uh, writer of uh, West Bengal, he has also mentioned Jamalpur workshop in one of one or two of his, uh, I think, one at least one of the stories. Oh, wow, that is, uh, uh, you know, that is, uh, thank you for sharing that. So I was not aware. So, uh, I, I, if, I, if I come across that, uh, that particular story or uh, whatever it is, novel or story, I'll, I'll uh, give a reference to you. Please, I'll be very grateful. So, Brancho here, Deepak, let me add something about gun making skills of Mugher. <laughs> Half set up the gun factory in his fort. He, the skills was passed on, were passed on you know, down the generation. Mm -hmm. and alive by an almost an unlimited supply of operated tubes from condemned steam locomotives. These tubes were specially imported from England and they were very high quality steel and seamless. So you know, they used to make uh, fences around the house, houses, railway houses out of these superheated tubes. They would get stolen. I was wondering why my house fence also got stolen. So I found out that they were taken away to make you know small guns, local brand guns. So they will bore it to the right size of the bullet and then you know, put a trigger mechanism. One of my teachers, you know, who also had a fence, whose fence was not stolen. I asked him, what have you done? You know, nobody steals your nobody steals a fence. He said, I have drilled holes in the tube at regular intervals, all along the length of the tube. So nobody can use it as a gun barrel. So that's, um, I, I think the supply is depleted and so is the gun skills. So <laughs> That's a very, very nice uh, anecdote. So, but I do uh, remember reading that uh, at the time of the war, the first world war, as well as the second world war, there was a lot of uh, equipment uh, that was made in the workshop and then supplied to the army. And, uh, uh, you know, it also, uh, I think there was some sort of a connection with the ordnance factory in Kirki and they apparently did not have even one reject from uh, the material that was made at the Jamalpur. During 1965 war, grenade shells were cast in Jamalpur in large numbers. It continued for about a year after the war ended. Grenade shells, including... Uh... Grenade shells. Oh. The shell of the grenade, not the uh, explosive part, but just the shell oh. itself. Oh, just the that shell. That was cast in the, what, what we call the uh, brass and white metal foundry. In fact, no. I joined Jamalpur in, after the war in January 66, oh, and the shells are still being made. You can see why it's called. It's found in Munar and parts of the southern western. Yeah, it was done when we were very much there. <laughs> one year approximately. According to me, the most interesting one on, in this group, is the one on the bottom center. It's called the pig nose frog or the purple frog. Do you know that this frog has been around for 80 million years? 80 million years in the world. Pugji, what is the future of uh, Jamalpur now? Uh, now that we are like, you know, winding towards uh, electrification and uh, mechanical on the decline. You are, you are muted. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. So yeah. uh, I think, uh, you know, I was actually muted uh, by design because uh, this is a question many others on this call can answer better than me, yeah. but I will give it a shot. And then, uh, uh, and then, so what has happened is that, uh, yes, the number of people who are working there is now down, down to about 9,000 uh, in the workshop and the overall uh, uh, railway setup is in, is in a huge amount of flux. So I think there will be an urgent need for reinvention yeah. in terms of uh, how do you stay uh, relevant and how do you stay uh, more tuned to the needs of uh, the overall uh, railway system and play a role in the transportation aspects. Uh, some of the schemes which I spoke about, uh, the apprentice mechanic scheme, the special class railway apprentices scheme, those schemes have been uh, uh, halted for the past few years uh, and uh, therefore uh, what is happening now mainly is uh, that uh, people who are joining the railways uh, as mechanical engineers this is the centralized place for training 
the workshop has uh, uh, continues to do a lot of activity uh, it's centered around locomotives and uh, also does uh, uh, diesel locomotives and also does a, a you know few other activities but i personally think that there will be an urgent need to introspect and reinvent itself to continue to stay relevant the way it has for the past 150 160 years how is the funding uh, of this place how is it funded what deepak sir has said i think uh, uh, jamalpur workshop has uh, veered away from local uh, local manufacturing and maintenance yes. and it's now more towards uh, wagon manufacturing and then maintenance as, right. as well as uh, 140 ton uh, crane yes those are being uh, manufactured and maintained over there so it has yeah. become a hub of uh, these activities the change is coming and the change is welcome so this is how jamalpur is adapting as it has always adapted in the past thank yes, you sir. thank you sir yeah. thank you gaurav i think that's a very very nice and uh, comprehensive answer uh, the... can i uh, come in yeah yes yes sir yes. bolie sure. so i think one uh, possibility of uh, revival is the what now the the national rail and transportation institute the university set up in vadodara which now uh, is going to the name is raja bondo kore the name is changing to gati shakti vishwavidyalaya and jamalpur at least the broader vision is jamalpur uh, the acra and all those at some point will fold in to this central university in any case one of the engineering streams which is uh, the railway and mechanical engineering uh, stream of the nrti uh, the students will move to jamalpur after they do a you know common curriculum at vadodara with the other uh, engineering streams so i think in some sense the use of the hostels and classroom and all that is uh, expected to be there you know so that's a uh, you know that's just about a possible revival of uh, jamalpur so jamalpur will remain a training institute is what i can see uh, i i want to come in here will uh, potentially a campus of the gati shakti vishwavidyalaya okay so what should you do yeah what happened uh, you know why jamalpur was chosen as a center for training long back in the previous to previous century was because it had every trade under the sun of mechanical engineering in one place whether it was foundry steel foundry iron foundry carpentry white metal shop uh, rolling mill even a power house uh, a, a steam power house with a turbine and uh, every possible trade and even a machine tool reconditioning shop so those things were provided an ideal ground for uh, ideal you know uh, framework for training of mechanical engineers in every possible trade today even though it has some activity going on but it is primarily reduced to basically reduced to painting fitting and welding do not provide sufficient training opportunities for anybody whereas it may exist as a training shoot because the buildings are there but i guess the nature of mechanical engineering itself has changed from what we had seen earlier so i don't think there will be much relevance of the jamalpur workshop in training uh, there will be some relevance for the institute because it's there uh, that's the only reason it will integrates with gati shakti university i don't know how it will because gati shakti is a university under the ugc act jamalpur is not uh, however let's hope thank you thank you sir Sakshi, you have a hand up. Yeah. Uh, hi, Deepak. This is not Sakshi. This is Deepankar. I unfortunately realize I'm logging in from the different account, but since the program has started, I did not change the account. First of all, congratulations on such a wonderful presentation. I did not know half the history, and it's such a wonderful thing to see. And for all the other people on uh, the group, I am Deepak's publisher. He's written a book uh, based on his experiences in the railways, which is the boy who loved trains. my question to you deepak is that we do get a glimpse of jamalpur um, in your book as well but all the information that is lying there do you plan to write another one on the history of jamalpur well i uh, i think there are uh, i would be very keen to but uh, uh, at the moment uh, dipankar maybe 
uh, if we can create the future of Jamalpur together, it would be more <laughs> interesting than the uh, than the history of Jamalpur. Uh, but yes, the history is very, uh, uh, very, very interesting. And you know, as I was preparing for this talk, uh, I was able to link a number of things uh, which happened at the time of the British. Especially that Mir Qasem era and how it all kind of connected to Jamalpur and subsequently the British taking up uh, control over India through the railways in which uh, Jamalpur played a very, very important part. So uh, this is a fascinating part of India's history and India's evolution, not just of the railways, but of uh, the entire country itself. So hopefully you will help me write another book on that. Uh, another trivia. Uh, uh, hello, Deepak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another trivia, you had shown the photograph of the Sita Kund. Yes. There are two more Kunds there, Ram Kund and Lakshman Kund. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow when I was posted in Jamalpur uh, in uh, uh, 1998 uh, to 2011, 2001 or so, at that time I had visited and Sita Kund was having warm water. It was actually sulfur spring. And the other two Kunds were cold and they were having... Uh, uh, moss and other things around, but whereas Sita Kund was clear. But when I went there uh, as CME uh, Eastern sometime in 2012, I think, at that time Sita Kund has also become, had become cold. I, I do not know what happened. So this mm. is something which was very, very strange and I found that uh, that was a change. Right, right. And I think uh, just uh, since you mentioned that, uh, the legend is that uh, when Sita had to go through the Agni Pariksha uh, after uh, Ram conquered uh, uh, Lanka, and when she had to go through the Agni Pariksha, then uh, she came out of it and then uh, she walked the, as the earth absorbed the heat, the heat was so intense. And I think there is some connection established between that and the hot spring, which you see in the Sita Kund. Yeah. So, so again, it's all, uh, it's a legend, but it's a story which I, uh, which I saw occur at multiple places uh, when I was researching on it. And uh, so it's certainly a part of uh, the legend uh, in different uh, Ramayanas, uh, not just in, uh, in one. So probably there's, uh, yeah, that's something I wanted to share. Right. Thank you. I feel that with the very large number of persons who have lived in Jamalpur among the participants today, we could carry on the entire day. So <laughs> I think we can end now and thank Deepak for an excellent presentation. Uh, I thought that I knew everything there was to know about Jamalpur, but mm -hmm. I'm the first one to admit that I learned a lot today. Thank you, Deepak, for that. Thank you. Uh, there was a mention of a book on the history of Jamalpur. Uh, see, in the year 2027, the special class apprenticeship scheme will complete 100 years. Of course, the scheme is now closed, but it will be 100 years since it started. Uh, I am at the moment working on a history book on the history of the special class railway apprentice scheme, which I intend to uh, get published in, in 2027. Of course, a large part of this uh, book will also have the history of Jamalpur in it. But it will be primarily the history of the special class railway apprentice scheme. Right, sir. Very nice. So anyway, thank you uh, uh, very much to everybody to participate. We had a very large audience today, among the largest that we have had. So thank you, Deepak. Thank you, everyone. And we meet again next mo next month on the third Sunday. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, Neil. Apurva, you have the recording. Uh, uh, it's it, it's being done yeah, on the, the web. I'll get it. Available on it's YouTube and one uh, one week. Time. Yeah, one week times. Yeah, I'll do get Perfect. it done. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Deepak. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thank you again. Have Deepak. a great day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.